Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we thank you for uh, tuning in to listen to our consideration of this subject. We've had Genesis chapter 3 read um, as the introduction this evening, largely because we want the last part of that chapter. What we're trying to do is set the background against which Bible prophecy uh, is to be understood. You see, God had made uh, the earth to be inhabited in Genesis chapter 1. There was a law given to the man in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 16, where he says, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And so a dying process began in the day that they ate of the tree, if that's what they chose to do. Genesis 3 records the fact that that's what they chose. And as a result of that, uh, there were the conversations which happened throughout that chapter, Uh, a condemnation on the serpent in verse 14 of chapter 3, and then there was uh, verse 16, the woman is addressed. In verse 17, the man is addressed. And there are uh, certain physical changes that take place in the serpent, the woman, the man. And in verse 18 and 19, the whole of nature was affected as a result of what the man and the woman chose to do. And so sin came into the world and with it, death. And so we live under a constitution of sin and death. But that's not what God had in mind. And we get a hint of this in verse 22, where we read, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So there were these two special trees in the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And the partaking of the tree of life would have imparted eternal life to Adam and Eve. That would have been a horrendous outcome now that they had taken of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and been condemned to be mortal sinners. And so the outcome of all this is mentioned in verse 22 where the man and the woman were driven out of the garden And God placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So man had been made and creation had been constituted as being very good. Adam and Eve had been given a law to keep with punishments for disobeying the law and there would have been correspondingly a reward for obedience. They chose to break that law. They were condemned to die. But you see, God's purpose with the earth was not in harmony with that outcome. And so there had to be a way out of that. And the way out, we can see, is something to do with this tree of life. It would have been a very bad thing had they eaten the tree of life at that time. But in verse 24, it tells us, that God arranged for the way to the tree of life to be kept. Now that word kept has two parts to its meaning. It means that it was barred so that they couldn't go back and partake of the tree of life, but it was kept there so that one day access to the tree of life would be granted. And if we come over to Revelation chapter 22 at the other end of the Bible, the very last chapter of the Bible, and Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12, we read there, this is Jesus speaking, he's the author of this book, and Jesus says in Revelation 22 verse 12, Behold, I come quickly, And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. See, they're very similar ideas to Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Based upon their works, 
they would be rewarded. Verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, which is what Adam and Eve failed to do. And notice the next words, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So you see the Bible from the first couple of chapters through the last chapter is talking about how we go from this situation where the way to the tree of life was barred but still kept there as something to hope for to the last chapter where the opportunity to partake of that tree is granted and so eternal life and a place in Christ's kingdom is offered to those whose works justify that outcome. So they're the bookends to the Bible. And inside that, we have Bible prophecy. Now, we want to give you a couple of examples of Bible prophecy uh, this evening. But before we do that, we'll just show you a couple of slides. We want to have a look, first of all, at... at this um, passage here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. Now that's just a, a couple of books before the book of Revelation. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, sorry, and verse 21. You see, the Bible contains prophecies, and we're going to have a look at that and make sense of the prophecies. But... There's no point in even starting that if these prophecies are iffy. If these prophecies are no better than no, those of Nostradamus or the clairvoyant or the thing in the newspaper about um, living with your stars and things like that. But in relation to the Bible, verse 19 of 2 Peter chapter 1 tells us that we those who read the Bible have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit of God is the source of Bible prophecies and therefore they deserve our attention. We would do well to take heed, it says. In Isaiah chapter 46, so this is about halfway through our Bibles, the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah chapter 46 and at verses 9 to 10. Isaiah 46, breaking into the record at verse 9, we read there, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do or my pleasure. What is God's pleasure? Well, we'll come to that. And a little bit later in the Old Testament, in the, uh, the Minor Prophets, just before um, the New Testament, we have in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So God reveals 
His secrets, those things that are coming that he hasn't yet revealed to anyone else, he reveals them to his servants, the prophets. And we have many of those prophecies written down and we can take heed to them. Now we're going to come across this idea of secret again in a little while when we have a look at a prophecy in the book of Daniel. So listen for that expression a little bit later. Now in the meantime, we want to come back to Genesis um, and look at one of the earliest prophecies recorded in the Bible. And we're certainly not going to go through all of them. We're only going to pick out a couple of the Bible prophecies to help us understand them. You see, in Genesis chapter 37, there was a young man in a large family that was in very difficult circumstances. He was the eldest son of the favoured wife, but all his older brothers hated him and were very jealous of him. His life was miserable as far as a family context goes. Some of the boys and girls in the audience might relate to that a little bit. Anyway, so there was in Genesis chapter 37 this man Jacob in verse 1. And he dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. That's the land we know today as Israel. And these are the generations of Jacob, verse 2. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhar and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. You see... The sons of the brothers of Joseph were not very good men. And uh, what happens as a result of this, because Joseph was living in these trying circumstances and things were just going to get so much worse. If for anyone who knows the story of Joseph, Joseph was about to be sold into slavery in Egypt when he was there for tens of years before things got better. But anyway, in verse 5 of Genesis 37, Joseph dreamed a dream and told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Why? Well, this is what he dreamed. Verse 6, he says, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And so here we have a situation where the jealous brothers of Joseph found cause by which they may be more jealous and treat him worse. But what did the dream mean from Joseph's point of view? Yes, things were bad. And he didn't know just how much worse they were going to get. But this dream was a prophecy of what would happen. So Joseph dreamed about these sheaves. And this is an interesting context for this dream. Sheaves are the stalks with the grain in the head that are bound together as a result of a bountiful harvest. So the context of this dream is about bounty and food available to eat. That's going to be relevant. And you see, this is what we need to do with Bible prophecy. We need to think about the careful choice of elements in Bible prophecy. And if we want to know what these elements mean, we need to read around the context or other places in the Bible where a similar element is mentioned. So, going back to verse 7. We have these sheaves in the field, and Joseph's sheaves stood upright, and all his brother's sheaves bowed down to him. Now, that's just like throwing petrol on a fire, isn't it? If there's a situation of jealousy like there was. We'll just put that to the side for the, for the moment. His brethren said unto him, verse 8, this is their reaction. Shalt thou indeed reign over us? You see, 
10 of his brothers were older than him. And in ancient society, it was very much a hierarchy based on position in the family. And these 10 brothers who were jealous of Joseph couldn't see any circumstances in which they would feel it appropriate to bow down. Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion or power or authority over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. But this dream was a prophecy, and we'll see how it was fulfilled. Verse 9, And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream more. Now this dream is in a different context because the relevance of it is extended. This dream talks about the, be, uh, the, um, the elements in the sky, sun, moon and stars. Now if you want to know the significance of the sun and the moon, go back to Genesis chapter 1, have a look on the fourth day and it will tell you there that it has to do with dominion and rulership. That's what the sun and the moon refer to. So Joseph had this dream and he said halfway through verse 9, Behold, I've dreamed a dream more and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. That is, they bowed down in reverence to Joseph. So this means that Joseph was in some way superior to the sun. Verse 10, he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I, so this is future, shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? That is absolute reverence and obeisance when you put your face in the dirt in front of whoever you're revering. And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So, what's all this to do with Bible prophecy? Well, you see, there came a time when this dream about the sheaves was fulfilled. And uh, if you come over to Genesis chapter 42... We have to skip through the the story of Joseph, how he was sold into slavery. He was in the the prison and uh, he eventually, after many, many years, was brought out of the prison and he was made the ruler in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. It's a very interesting story. We don't have time to go into all that. We just break into the record now where Joseph is sitting as the head of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. Joseph had the charge of all the administration. There was a very great famine through the Middle East at this time, and things were very bad year after year after year. But there was another dream that was a prophecy we can't go into. Joseph, in his wisdom, had put food aside in years of plenty so there would be food available in years of famine. Remember, this is the fulfilment of this one where the sheaves bowed down to Joseph's sheaf. Come to Genesis 42 and verse 6. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land because he had all this food stored up, opened the gates and sold to the people. And Joseph's brethren, verse 6, halfway through, came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth so that they could buy food because they were in desperate situation. And there, see, this is a personal prophecy to Joseph where even though things were bad and for decades things seemed to get worse and worse, there was always in his mind this dream. This dream that promised how God would look after him. Even though the circumstances didn't look like it, it came to pass. 
that his brothers came down and in the context of food for their families, bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Now that fulfilment of that promise would have given Joseph encouragement to believe the other promise. Let's go back and have a look at that other promise. Yeah, this is back in Genesis 37. We just remind ourselves of what that promise was. Genesis 37, um, verse 9, he says, I dreamed yet another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And so we have this picture of all these stars, and it's eleven stars, and he had eleven brothers. So you do the maths. Everyone else got it right. So if the brothers were the stars, who was the sun and the moon? Well, his father knew. His father knew because he said there, halfway through verse 10, shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Shall I and thy mother? So here was Jacob and he was identifying with the sun. And he identified the moon in the dream with Joseph's mother. Now, why is this significant? Because if we go back two pages in our Bible, back to Genesis chapter 35 and verse 18, we find that, we'll start reading at verse 16, we read about Joseph's mother's death. Genesis 35, 16, And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labour. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labour, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And there was Joseph's brother, the twelfth of the sons. So, by the time we come to Genesis 37, Joseph's mother is not in the picture. So, whereas the previous dream was about Joseph's personal life and the change of status that God would eventually, in his good time, bring for Joseph, the second dream dealt with, in part, his deceased mother. And as Jacob said, the interpretation of that dream required Joseph's mother to be alive to bow down to him. So this was a far-reaching prophecy. One dream was just a couple of decades away. The other dream wasn't fulfilled for some millennia. But the first dream and its fulfilment encouraged Joseph to believe that the second dream would be fulfilled at a time which is still in the future. The two dreams that Joseph received very close together, both significant, but one that was particularly relevant to his situation with his mother. So, That's one st sort of dream where it relates to someone's personal circumstances. And we're going to come and pick up this thing about Joseph's mother being alive again a little bit later on. Now there's another style of dream which appears uh, in Daniel chapter 2. And some of you may be familiar with this, but others may not. And you'll notice that these dreams they all have this aspect like the tree of life that started back in early days and was fulfilled right at the end of the Bible. All of these dreams point to the end times. This one here, Daniel chapter 2, is also a dream. So we read in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. 
He had some restless nights. He saw something that he couldn't understand. And like they did in verse 2, he called in the wise men. And that he asked them for the interpretation. We've just uh, jumped ahead too far. Okay, so the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans were all come, uh, called in to interpret this dream and of course they couldn't. They didn't even know what the dream was. But as a test, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't going to tell them the dream. So their job was to tell him what the dream was and therefore he would have confidence that they would be able to interpret it. So Nebuchadnezzar's dream was something like what we have depicted here on the screen. Uh, so verse 4, these uh, wise men that were supposed to be able to predict the future, um, the Chaldeans and so forth, said to the king, uh, Let thy, tell thy servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. And he didn't like that. He said, um, if you can't tell me what the dream was, I don't trust your interpretation. And they said, well, we can't do it. And he said, well, you're going to lose your lives. Anyway, the, um, the short story is that Daniel, one of the Hebrew captives, came in before the king and um, there was a different story. So, verse 17. Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. Now, we've already looked at a couple of places that told us that prophecies that came from God could be relied on. Daniel trusted that with his life. Um, verse 18, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. Here's that word secret that we referred to earlier that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And so in verse 18, and now verse 19, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So what was this dream that disturbed Nebuchadnezzar's slumber? Breaking into the record at verse 28, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So it's one of the most common things that we want is to know the future. And it's always been that way. People make a living professing to be able to tell you the future. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know the future. You see, he had established this kingdom and he was very proud of it and he thought that the mastermind behind all that was Nebuchadnezzar and now that I've got all this he said uh, what's tomorrow going to bring like what's going to happen to all this empire that he had created it's quite a natural sort of question well this is what the dream was about and so verse 28 says, There's a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So this interpretation, we will see from verse 38, starts with the time when the, the dream was given. But the interpretation is for the latter days. So just like Joseph's dream was given in his day and there was, on the first dream, there was fulfilment close to the time. There was another part that meant it get right through to the end, just like the, uh, the tree of life. So, he was, um, Joseph, uh, Daniel then goes on to explain uh, what the dream was. Verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. Now, it's interesting. Just like in Joseph's dreams, there was sheaves of food and there was the celestial bodies. Two different images, two different 
metaphors to describe two different aspects of interpretation. So in Daniel chapter 2, we have this great warrior Nebuchadnezzar who developed this empire and the image is about a warrior. This great image, verse 31 says, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form there was thereof was terrible. It was a terrifying thing. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. So it was an image made out of various metals until you come down to the feet where there's a metal and clay mixture. Verse 34. What disturbed Nebuchadnezzar, apart from how terrifying the image was, was the next thing. You see, Nebuchadnezzar would have been able to conceive of a great warrior that struck fear into anyone who saw him. But what came next, he couldn't wrap his head around. What came next? Verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. So this magnificent image was destroyed by a stone, something of seemingly no significance would destroy this edifice of an image. Verse 35. <coughs> then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together. <coughs> and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. So let's just look at that bit first. <coughs> All these metal parts of the image, including the legs and the feet, ended up being attacked by a stone and became of no more value than the chaff that's left over once the grain has been extracted from the head of the plant. All this magnificence was just turned to dust and blown away. Now that's not something that the head of an empire wants to be told about. But it goes on. Verse 35, the last bit, And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And we'll tell the interpretation thereof before the king. The end of verse 38 says that thou art the head of gold. So in this image, Nebuchadnezzar, as the head of the Babylonian army and empire, was the head of gold. And he says, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, so the golden empire of Babylon was not going to last forever. It would be replaced, unbelievably, by something somewhat inferior. How's that going to work? Another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass. So as we go along, we go down in value of the metals until in the end you've got this mixture of iron and clay right at the end at the bottom of the image this third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things and the iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise and whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, and there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. 
And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, and they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And so there's going to be this rather fragile combination of empires and groups of people, the seed of men, talking about the weak sort of group that are trying to uh, bind in with the iron. And verse 44 says, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So, starting from Nebuchadnezzar's day, the head of gold, this prophecy extends right through to the last days. That's what he said there in verse uh, 28. Its fulfilment is in the latter days. So this dream, it kind of doesn't make sense. The interpretation is contradictory. The interpretation was that there were successive empires. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And then the Roman Empire divided. And then the stone came. Successive over time. And we could actually put dates beside it. Just look in your history book of when these empires existed. They were successive. But the dream said that these pieces were all broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summing threshing floor. That's verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together. So while this image represented successive empires, at the end, they were all going to be there. And so we are looking for in the fulfilment of this prophecy, some empire that it combines. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. And it's all going to stand up as one body at the end. And what's going to happen to that? Well, this insignificant stone is actually the most significant part of the whole dream. Cut out of the mountains without hands. No human involvement. Just like Mary conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and a stone was created. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And this stone power is going to destroy all the kingdoms of the world. God's going to set up a kingdom, verse 44 says, which shall never be destroyed. So the might of the Babylonian Empire was short-lived and the others would come and go. But something was going to happen on the earth that's in harmony with eating of the tree of life, in harmony with Joseph being able to see his mother and her bow down to him after she was dead and came back to life in the resurrection. All these things point forward to the fulfilment of God's purpose with the earth. Kingdom shall not be left to other people. See, Nebuchadnezzar knew that he could only live for so long and then his son or someone else would take over. But this kingdom that he's talking about here is talking about a kingdom that is ruled by those who never die. See, we've got to look at these little significant words. We are looking at people who don't die. The kingdom's not passed to or, or left to other people. But it's going to break in pieces and consume the kingdoms of men and stand forever. So, this is a political prophecy. It talks about the politics of the Middle East and those areas around um, the Middle East, the empires of the time, 
right through succession of them. It's interesting that an almost identical prophecy is given in Daniel chapter 7. But in this prophecy, instead of using the metals of an image, they are the beasts of the field that represent the different empires. And so, while we don't really have time to go into that this evening, we have a parallel prophecy given to a different type of person where men are represented as beasts. This is a prophecy that was Daniel's dream as opposed to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so the elements changed because of the character of the person that received the dream. But the dream continues, and you see in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near unto him, and there was given, unto, uh, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So you see the elements of the end of that prophecy are the same as Daniel 2 verse 44. And of course it is extends over into Daniel chapter 8 where we have um, some more of the interaction between these animals as we change from one empire to another. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that the prophecies of the Bible often start from the time period in which they were given, but they all go forward to a time in the future when the Lord Jesus Christ will set up the kingdom of God and have power and dominion over all the earth. Now, there's prophecies in the Bible that relate to you and me too. We want to have a look at that now. One of these is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Because this reward, this blessing to come, is not limited to Joseph. It's not limited to the Lord Jesus Christ and the political power that he shall establish. There's promises to you and me on a very personal level. In 2 Timothy chapter 4... We have the, um, the Apostle Paul talking to his friend, a fellow believer called Timothy. Timothy was a much younger man. He might have been what you might call a protege. And Timothy is about at the end of his life. He's about to be killed uh, by the Roman authorities. And so in verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, the living, and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. So we're talking about a time when Christ is going to judge the world and it's to do with the time of his kingdom. We just looked at that from Daniel chapter 2 and 7. That's a time in the future. So this is pinning Paul's circumstances and what he's looking forward to into these Bible prophecies that we've looked at. In verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And so there's, there's a couple of image, images here. Just like we had Joseph with the sheaves and then with the stars and the sun and moon. Paul says, I fought a good fight. So there's the idea of wrestling I finished my course. There's the idea of racing. I've kept the faith. And so we see there the, the spiritual aspect of this, his faithfulness, his endurance, and so forth. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So based upon the imagery of <clears throat> the fighting and the racing, where there's a coronal wreath, a crown, that's given to the victor. The Apostle Paul is following along that same line. And he says, because I fought a good fight, because I finished my course, because I kept the faith, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. So he was looking forward, inspired by God to write this, so we know that it is true and guaranteed, 
not just his wishful thinking. It's a prophecy. It's sure and firm. There's laid out for the Apostle Paul something which he calls a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give him at that day. What day? It's the day when the tree of life is available. It's the day when Joseph will see his mother alive again. It's the day when Daniel 2 verse 44 is fulfilled and that other verse in Daniel chapter 7. It's the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth, as verse 1 said here. When the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You see, this is not one man's victory. This victory is something that you and I can share in. If we, like Paul, fight a good fight, finish our course, and keep the faith, we too, like the Apostle Paul, can have that crown of righteousness given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Come over in conclusion to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, and we're breaking into the record here in um, verse 8. Now, Revelation is a book of symbols. It tells us that right in the first couple of verses of the book. It's all about symbols. But we've seen symbols in the prophecies before. So we're not phased by that. We can handle that. Verse 8 of Revelation 5 says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. The Lamb is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. So here are faithful ones bowing down to the Lord Jesus Christ, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odours, which are the prayers of saints. Saints are those who are the called-out ones who are faithful to God and to the gospel preached by the Lord Jesus Christ. And they sung a new song saying, Thou, the Lamb, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, Jesus Christ was crucified 2,000 years ago. And through that crucifixion, He has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So there's no restriction on who can benefit from the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And there we have our personal involvement in the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of God's kingdom over the whole earth as prophesied in Daniel. You and I can be there, but we have to be like the Apostle Paul. Three three criteria he mentioned there. You can go back to Timothy and have a look at those. But this promise, this prophecy of what the future holds is available to you and me if we are like the Apostle Paul and follow that example.